Dorita says, a king by the name of Nabopolassar revolted against Assyrian rule. Why? Why do we revolt? Because they destroyed the Babylonian capital. And here you see Ashur Banipal, the last great Assyrian king. Uh, man, he was a destroyer. When he died, Assyria was in turmoil and Nabopolassar crowned himself as a new king of Babylon. In what year did his wife give birth to a son? Birth of a son in those days was something. It was 630 BC when Nabopolassar and his wife gave birth to a little boy. What shall we call him, father? Asked the queen mother as she looked at this tiny little boy. By the way, who in your family decides the name of your firstborn? Shushan, ancient capital of the Medes. <clears throat> so Nabopolassar, Nabopolassar referred to the name of an exceptionally wise and brave king which once occupied Shusan. Sweetheart, his name was Nebuchadnezzar number one. And I want my son to carry his name and also become a hero. Nebuchadnezzar the second. At one time, he says to his wife, the Elamites raided Babylon and confiscated the image of our famous god, Marduk. Can you believe it? Nebuchadnezzar, number one, risked his life in bringing back our precious Bel Marduk. My wife, I want to tell you something. Our child will be called Nebuchadnezzar II. And I pray that he would become a great conqueror. Did Nebuchadnezzar II equal or surpass Nebuchadnezzar I? Yes. He became the greatest king in Babylonian history, mentioned in the Bible and many other extra-biblical sources. Inspiration deemed it proper to eternalize him in Holy Writ in the Bible. And this is our present study. Nabu Kuduri Usar. May God protect the boundaries of my kingdom. Loretta has a question for us. How did Nabu Pulasa, the father of Nebuchadnezzar, fulfill a prophecy concerning the destruction of Nineveh? You know, it's marvelous how you, you put the puzzles together and you get a bigger picture of Nebuchadnezzar. Your shepherds slumber. Have you seen somebody on a job slumber? O king of Assyria, your nobles rest in the dust. Your people are scattered on the mountains and no one gathers them. So Nahum the prophet, by the way, Capernaum is called after Nahum, Capernaum, city of the prophet Nahum. This prophet sees the future of Nineveh, the future of the mighty Assyrian Empire. Your injury has no healing. The disaster would be disastrous. Your wound is severe. All who hear the news of you will clap their hands over you because they were so cruel. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually for three hundred years? They ruled the world with an iron rod, destroyed lives. Mm. That's another research. You can look at my research on the series called The Rise and the Fall of the Assyrian Empire. Very interesting. What do these artifacts tell us about Seacharis I and Nabopolassar, the father of Nebuchadnezzar? 
Remember, we're going to look at the fulfillment of a certain prophecy. The guards of the religious capital of Assyria were not able to withstand the power of Bible prophecy. Prophecy said Assyria would be destroyed. They could not stand against prophecy. We are standing at the ruins of Nineveh caused by Nabopolassar and Sehacheres, the first in 612. The Bible predicted the destruction. I went there and I took my pictures. You know, I wonder if Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar and his father, Nabopolassar, about the fulfillment of this prophecy of Nahum. Partial reconstruction of ancient Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. The very first mention of his name was found on a clay tablet, mentioning his reconstruction of the temple of Marduk. That's the first thing we discovered in his biography. During my recent visit to Babylon, I found the sign pointing to the direction of the specific temple, where his name is mentioned for the first time. Would you like to see it? Sorry, this is all that's left of the most illustrious temple in human history. Emptiness. They carried the stones and the wealth away. Nothing is left. Now this is the ruins of ancient Sodom, Bab Edra. Now what is the biblical relationship between Babylon and ancient Sodom? Isaiah says, and Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, best, most splendid. The beauty of the Chaldeans' pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at these ruins. Look at these ruins. Babylon. Both cities ended in ruins. This is the end result of persistent, destructive Willful sin. Do you know when I look at these sites, ruins, I ask God, please help me not to harbor any revenge, only love for my enemies. Uh, don't be destroyed. Don't fall into ruins by wrong sinful attitude. Joined us on a very important visit to the ancient city called Haran. And the cameramen are ready to record the story of Haran. Entrance to the excavated field is prohibited. Only if you're an archaeologist you could go in. In the year 2003, archaeologists discovered that Haran existed during the times of Sumer, that's a Sumerian, Ur, Assyria, and Babylon. So Haran is a very, very, very old city. It's mentioned in the Bible. Now, could there be a link between Haran and Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar? Yes. The Babylonian Chronicles, they recently discovered another one, tell us that Nabopolassar and his son Nebuchadnezzar came here to the site you're seeing on the screen in 610 BC. They engaged in a military campaign against the Assyrians. Remember the Assyrians were cruel. They destroyed Babylon more than once. And it was time to pay back. After the, the destruction of Nineveh, the Syrian army regrouped at a place called Karkemish. And we're going to visit the site as well as Haram. By the way, retaliation can only be neutralized by forgiveness. Do you want to neutralize your retaliation syndrome? Forgive your enemy. You know, history is just full of wars. 
because we retaliate. Let's leave Haran and follow on the footsteps of Nebuchadnezzar to Karkemish. So Nebuchadnezzar and his son were at Haran. But I want to take you to another site called Karkemish. It comes from the, the Moabite word Kemosh. Kemosh. Karkemosh. Karkemesh. And here you see Karkemesh on the signboard. On the other side, it's called Jarablus. The great city uh, was across the Euphrates. And today, some of it, the ruins are in Turkey, the other ruins are in Syria. At this stage, we have to ask the ancient historians to tell us more about the famous war that took place at Karkemesh. This is just a sketch of the Fertile Crescent, as it's called. And you see Mesopotamia, you see Assyria, you see Phoenicia, right down Egypt. The armies traveled alongside the rivers because you have to drink. The rest is desert. <laughs> now, Assyria, as you can see here, was the buffer between the king of the north this case, Nabopolassar or Nebuchadnezzar, and the king of the south in Egypt. So what would happen if Assyria would be completely defeated? Well, this would give the Babylonians the right of way to travel peacefully and make war on Egypt. Any indication that Israel would be involved in the clash between the two empires? Yes, they had to cross Israel, both the king of the north and the king of the south. Second Chronicles 35. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Neku, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish. Can you see Josiah? a king of Judah and Karkemesh. So here we, here we read uh, front page news. King of Egypt came up to fight against Karkemesh by the Euphrates. And then a sad few words. And Josiah went out against him. You know, Jeremiah predicted that the Babylonians would be the new empire. And he warned Judah not to fight, fight the Babylonians. Now, when did Nebuchadnezzar and his father fought against the Assyrian so that regrouped at Haran? Can you remember? 610 BC. Exactly one year later, in 609, when Pharaoh returned to protect the Assyrian uh, property at Karkemesh. Took only one year, and then he came there. So the king of the north and the king of the south came to Karkemesh. And this battlefield is very important. I took a picture of Karkemesh. This is on the Turkish side. You can fill up 724. Any time of the day, while looking at the pump, I wished I could fill my mind 724 with some of some kind of chemical to refresh my memory on ancient history. We tend to forgive when we get old. Before the flood, that was not a problem. But we need to fill up our spiritual tanks. 724. Get that spiritual liquid to carry you through life. Loretta, what advice did Jeremiah give to Zedekiah when the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem at the later stage? Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, 
if you surely surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then your soul shall live. They had to surrender to the new world empire. This city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. This was the advice that Jeremiah gave to the kings of Israel. Did he give this advice to Josiah? Yes. But if you do not surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then the city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans. They shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hand. You know, when I read this, I thought of God's amazing mercy and kindness. There's always punishment when there's transgression. But God wants to lessen the punishment, the pain. If a wicked sinner heeds the prophet's warning, the punishment will not be so harsh. Listen to the prophets of the Bible. And your punishment will be a little less. You know, here at Megiddo, I, I thought, was it necessary for Josiah to die at this early stage of his life? He wanted to protect Babylon from the Egyptians. But God says, no, no. Babylon will be the new victor. Leave him alone. He didn't listen. Listen to some of the heartbreaking stories of these stones. Jesus says, the stones will cry out. In his days, Pharaoh Neku, king of Egypt, went to the aid of the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him. Why? He wanted to protect Babylon. If God protects a country, you don't have to help God in protecting it. And Pharaoh Neku killed him at Megiddo when he confronted him. There's a lesson to be learned. You know, sometimes we want to help God doing his job. Leave it to him. He knows how to handle situations. Here at the restorations of Megiddo, and they're still busy. I was there a few days ago. I thought, don't use a crowbar of retaliation on people. Use a towel of forgiveness and restoration. Don't destroy people. Build people. You will be remembered by your posterity if you do this. Paul says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Why did Josiah Ignored the advice that caused his death. Please accept the advice from the prophets, modern prophets and ancient prophets. Listen to the sad account echoing from Megiddo. Then his servants moved his body in a chariot from Megiddo, brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. Do not allow the chariot of retaliation to transport you to your grave. Forgive, but do not retaliate. You're looking at a, a Babylonian lion. Look at his body language. What do you see here? Remember, this, this line is representing Nebuchadnezzar. What do you notice about this lion? Have a good look. What do you notice about this line? The first one's tail was up. What does that mean? I'm going to destroy. We also have a body language. 750,000. When I first studied uh, at FAMSA, we had a little book. Body, uh, body signs, body language. Now, they've discovered more. 
people look at your body language and they they read you so let us cherish peaceful thoughts tail down not tail up what like this one clay tablets cylinder cylinders clay cylinders when one reads what Nebuchadnezzar wrote you discover that he was brilliant he had the knowledge of Sumer and Akkad and Daniel could converse with him and showed him what the Old Testament tells him now on one of these cylinder uh, cylinders uh, he writes about his role model model have you got a role model yes i had one too i won't mention his name but the germans didn't like him <laughs> he was hanging in my bed above my on, on the on the on the on the wall now there's a there's a, a name called theophoric 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 means there's the name of a deity in your name now king naram sin the role model of nebuchadnezzar was a theophoric name a theophoric name as i said has got a deity's name in your name so naram sin can you think of a god the name sin in Akkadian is the moon god. Naram means beloved. So Naram Sin means the beloved of the moon god, a theophoric name. If your name is Isaac or Jacob or Michael, these are theophoric names. I discovered Naram Sin here in the museum at Istanbul, this is Istanbul, I also discovered him in the Louvre, that uh, piece of uh, artistic uh, finish is, is, is beautiful. Here's another one. The first Mesopotamian king called himself God of Akkad, the role model of Nebuchadnezzar. His title was Lugal Ani Mundu, king of four quarters king of the universe during his time he ruled from sea to sea and performed many heroic deeds and Nebuchadnezzar read about him he said I want to be like Naram Sin beloved of the moon the young Nebuchadnezzar decided he wanted to be like Naram Sin and he did uh, be careful of your role models they may disappoint you what do you see in the stele of naram sin look carefully they all are looking up to him on the left side and he's twice as big as they let's look at some of his accomplishments so the soldiers are looking at him they followed him we can all of, only follow a leader if he lives according to the principles of the bible how does a person change paul says by beholding we become changed so get good friends look at their good points and you will change but look at jesus the great role model study his life and he will change. Nebuchadnezzar was changed because he looked at a great hero, Naram Sin. Uh, this is Nippur, a very interesting site. Uh, the building on top was built by the uh, archaeologists who did some digging here. Yeah? They discovered that Naram Sin, the role model of Nebuchadnezzar, erected the temple and the zigg ziggurat that you see here is he, he restored and also the, 
the city wall, the protecting wall. So his footprints are here. And these stones testify of his great involvement at this ancient religious city. Nebuchadnezzar also had an interest in the religious temples. Like his role model, Naram Sin, Nebuchadnezzar was also here restoring the temples of Enlil and other sacred buildings. So what his role model did, he also did, performed the same thing. Studying about these two ancient restorers, a thought came to me. By the way, this is not Naran Sin and Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> At the end of Nebuchadnezzar's life, another hero replaced Naran Sin. Don't miss out on the last lecture. It was the great warrior of Calvary who defeated Satan by his own death and became the great restorer of ruined human lives. Nebuchadnezzar discovered him. Have you discovered the marvelous healing power of this hero? He's able to heal all our brokenness and give us a new identity. These men recorded the history of Naram Sin. Nebuchadnezzar and Jesus right here at Nippur. Let us return to the battlefields of Haran and Carchemish. Here you see Carchemish next to the Euphrates. Let's do a little revision. Who was here before Nebuchadnezzar came here? The Assyrian and the Egyptian forces. The Egyptian forces protected the Assyrians, especially when this, the empire came down. Who conquered Haran in 610? The king of the north, Nabopolassar and his son Nebuchadnezzar. And who conquered Haran in 509? A year later, the king of the south. So when you study Revelation chapter 11, you will find that you can use the historic history of the king of the north and the king of the south with a greater appreciation. So they won the battle at Haran and then came the king of the south and he won the battle for Haran. One loses, the other wins. This is all about Daniel 11. What happened here at Carchemis four years later in 605? You know, we keep on fighting until we win the battle. This is what happened here. Nebuchadnezzar crossed the Euphrates River. Isn't this a beautiful picture of that mighty river? And he defeated Pharaoh and a huge coalition that came with him to destroy the king of the north, Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah saw this battle in vision and the Babylonian chronicles confirm the accuracy of the Bible. What does the history of Carchemish tell us? At times the king of the south gained the victory and at times the king of the north won the victory. For more detail, please watch my series on the book of Daniel or look at archaeological themes, typology, which Walter Fight and myself did together. You know, it confirms Daniel's description in chapter 11. You have to look at type and then to anti-type to get a clear picture. Nebuchadnezzar was entering a new prophetic role. Listen to this description of this great king. An idolater by birth, and training at the head of an idolatrous people. Hmm. He had nevertheless an innate sense of justice and right. Innate sense of justice and right. And God was able to use him as an instrument for the punishment of the rebellious and for the fulfillment 
of divine purpose. Tell me, did God predict the fall of Judah? Yes. Jeremiah says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So Nebuchadnezzar is part of God's prophecy. Type. And then we look at Antitype. Now why was it necessary for Nebuchadnezzar to punish Judah? Well, he was a fair and a just man. Lex Talionis. He applied this. You see, Judah rejected God, their Redeemer, and worshipped the detestable images of their heathen neighbors. So Israel said to God, listen, we've got another God. God wanted to save them. And when you transgress, he punishes you in order to save you. Punishment must go with love. The runes tell us of a vision that Jeremiah had for a battle that took place right here. Archaeology brings us the shocking news that Israel and Judah became more polytheistic than the surrounding nations. Let's listen to Jeremiah's vision of the battle of Carchemish. The word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah the prophet against the nations, against Egypt, concerning the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates in Carchemish. This is the introduction to a vision. And which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, defeated in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Listen to the progression of this battle. Order the buckler and shields, and draw near to battle. Harness the horses, and mount up, you horsemen. Stand forth with your helmets, polish the spears, put on the armor. And in vision he sees how these two kings, north and south, prepares for one of the greatest battles in history. Why have I seen them dismayed and turned back? Yani he thought that the Egyptian coalition would win the battle. Why have I seen them dismayed and turned back? Their mighty ones are beaten down. So Nebuchadnezzar was winning this battle. They have speedily fled. They are gone and did not look back. For fear was all around, says the Lord. In this vision, Jeremiah sees the Egyptians with their coalition fleeing from Carchemish. They lost the battle. With their numbers and weapons, they should have won. And Jeremiah is surprised at the outcome of the battle. Do not let the swift flee away, nor the mighty man escape. They will stumble and fall toward the north by the river Euphrates. In a vision he saw the, sees the entire battle. In Jerusalem, Jeremiah sees in this vision how people die here on the banks of the river. The Pharaoh of Egypt lost the battle because he rejected prophecy. If he had listened to the prophecy, he would not have challenged Nebuchadnezzar. You know, if we willfully reject the messages of the prophets, we too will lose the battle, the battle of our lives. We have a prophet. Read your Bible and listen to the prophets. You know, when I stood here at the Euphrates, where it all happened, I thought of the importance of obedience to the prophets, God's prophets. You can lose your life if you ignore the prophet. The Babylonian Chronicles authenticate the biblical narrative of the Bible. So what you read on this piece of stone, you read in Jeremiah 46. 
who is coming up like a flood, whose waters move like the rivers. Egypt rises up like a flood. This is very interesting uh, f- uh, language that he uses. And its waters move like the river. And he says, I will go up and cover the earth. I will destroy the city and its inhabitants. Beautiful imagery describing Egypt who is determined to destroy the king of the north. You know, as the Nile at times overflows its banks, so Egypt thought he could likewise overflow and conquer the world with his military strength. But the prophet says, it will not happen. They did not read the prophecies. They could have. Come up, O horses, and rage, O chariots, and let the mighty men come forth, the Ethiopians. Now, now he, he tells us this was a coalition. By the way, the Ethiopians was a mighty nation. So the Ethiopians was part of that coalition. The Ethiopians and the Libyans, who handle the shield, and the Lydians, who handle and bend the bow. He sees this great coalition coming to destroy what God said would not happen. No matter how big the coalition that God that, that wanted to destroy the Babylonians, God will be victorious and save you and me if a coalition came, comes against us. God was not on the side of the Egyptians. He was on the side of Nebuchadnezzar. For this is the day of the Lord of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge himself on his adversaries. The sword shall devour. It shall be saturated and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts has a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. He sees the sin of vision. Now, just something interesting here. The Lord of hosts. One of the most majestic, reverent, inspired titles of God. The Lord God of hosts. The entire human race on this planet and the unfallen human beings on a billion other planets. Let us never underestimate God's omnipotent power to save the hardened sinner like I and you, you and I. Here at the Euphrates at Karkamesh, God performed a miracle and gave Nebuchadnezzar the victory over one of the greatest military co- coalitions in history. If you and I are obedient, he will fight for us and also give us the victory. Do you long for victory in your life, my friend? God can give it. No coalition of temptations can destroy you if you make God your shield. Egypt will find healing after a devastating fall only from God. Jeremiah 46, 11. A message to Egypt. Go up to Gilead and take balm. O virgin, daughter of Egypt, in vain you will use many medicines. You shall not be cured. You know, God loves people. He says to Egypt, listen, you're going to lose the battle. Your medicine will not help you. You have to go to other healing properties. There's an old song which says, there is a balm in Gilead that heals the sin-sick soul. You know, sometimes we try different methods to heal our sin situation. But my dear friend, there's only one 
medicine that could help us. The balm of Gilead, the balm which comes from God. He is a psychiatrist. He is a psychologist. There is a balm in Gilead. Go to that balm and be you. Egypt didn't do it. And I don't know if you've been to Egypt. The nations have heard of your shame. And your cry has filled the land. For the mighty man has stumbled against the mighty. They both have fallen together. Why should we study the history of Nebuchadnezzar? There are beautiful gems in this biography. Is there healing power in these stories? Yes, there is. Paul writes, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. This includes the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And it is profitable for doctrine. How to understand doctrine? For reproof. How to reprove someone? Or let the Bible reprove you? For correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Nothing in the Bible is unimportant. The study of Nebuchadnezzar, which is mentioned many times in the Bible, is important for us to study. It is important also to study the physical war between the king of the north and the king of the south. Why? Because Daniel refers to it in chapter 11. The physical war is a type of the end time war that will soon take place. And another king of the north, Jesus Christ, is going to win the battle. Nebuchadnezzar was just a type of the greater king of the north. What do you see here at Karkemesh? I, I mean, in uh, Turkey, and I took a picture of destruction over there by ISIS. Have you ever noticed how many people were involved in the Syrian war? The Russians were there, the Americans were there, and other countries. You know, when I did the study, I. I thought, is God trying to focus our attention on the ancient history of the battle that took place right here, today, at Karkemesh? It's, it's still an ongoing war. While here, my thoughts went out to a vision that John saw on the Isle of Patmos concerning the Euphrates. It says, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Now this is symbolic. And its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. What is going to happen when God makes an end to wickedness? The king of heaven will come to take us to a heaven of safety and peace. Those who endeavor to obey all the commandments of God will be opposed and derided. So what? They can stand only in God. That's your only safety. In order to endure the trial before them, they must understand the will of God as revealed in his word. They can honor him only as they have a right conception of his character, government, and purposes, and act in accordance with them. None but those who have fortified the mind with the great truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. Have you fortified your minds with the truths of the Bible? Then you'll be able to stand in the last great conflict. To every soul will come the searching test. Shall I obey God rather than men? The decisive hour is even now at hand. Are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word? Are we prepared to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Father, thank you 
for the history of Nebuchadnezzar. Thank you for the lessons that we can learn. Help us not to be like Egypt, ignoring prophecy. And help us to adore the other king of the north, God the Father. And as we study, may our lives be enriched. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you for watching this presentation. To subscribe to our channel, click here, then click the bell to get notifications. For the next presentation, click here. See you next time.